Good morning. I want you all stand with us. We're going to worship. We're going to celebrate the birth of our Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Angels, we have heard on high. Let's join our voices together this morning, and let's worship Him. Welcome to those of you who is uh, uh, joining us uh, online via live stream. Pardon me. Sorry about that, guys. Technical stuff. Let's worship the Lord. good to be here with you all. I almost uh, forgot I had to come up here. I was into singing this morning. And so uh, good to be here worshiping and singing uh, Christmas songs that we are familiar with that bring and uh, praise to our Lord and worship Him. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Isaiah 53. 
uh, verses 1 through 5. And we are today looking at the humanity of Jesus as we think about his, the fact that he was born uh, reveals to us that Jesus became a man. He took on flesh. And so let's read from Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5 together. It says this, Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. And we are here today to worship a Savior who took on flesh to heal us, to be wounded as a man for us because of his great love for us. And so we see in this passage uh, multiple references to the humanity of Jesus. The fact that he grew up just like you and I grow up. Children growing up, getting older, growing in size. No impressive form or appearance. He was just a normal person, a human being like you and I. A man who knew sickness. And we uh, can relate to that. We see sickness. Have we seen, have seen sickness this year? Jesus knew sickness. And he was pierced for us as a man. And so we are here to praise this God who came to us to be like us so that we can know him. So let's pray uh, together as we worship him. Father, we thank you that you have considered us. And we know this as we think on the reality of the birth of Jesus, that it is you considering us and seeing our need and coming to us in a way that we can know you. Sending your son to take on human form so that we can be brought back to you. Lord, we thank you that Jesus humbled himself for, to meet our need. And we are here to worship you. We are here to praise you for this birth of this Savior who had to come in order to save us. And we praise you. We worship you. We pray that you would be glorified and honored as we think on you and your great love for us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the children uh, that's in here may remember this song from last year. We're going to do that. And uh, we're going to worship our Lord and uh, worship Him as we can contemplate His birth on that glorious night. Yeah. 
We can, we can worship, Lord, through our, through our applause. And we're, Lord, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. You are worthy. Thank you, Lord.
Good morning and welcome uh, as we worship our Lord this morning. And this week is a, a week that the world can't help but know about Christmas. And for us as Christians, it means so much more. And it's an opportunity for us to talk to our family members and friends and co-workers and neighbors about the true meaning that we know that happens in God's Word. And we know that God sent His Son to save humanity from ourselves, from our own sin. And so this morning we're going to hear Pastor Andy preach from Matthew chapter 1. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18, or you can follow along on the screen. Uh, Hear God speak through His perfect and holy word this morning from Matthew chapter 1. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Heavenly Father, we can't even comprehend the depth of this. We can't even comprehend the divide between us and you. It's it's above us. We cannot even understand how deep our sin runs and how much we separate ourselves from you by the way that we follow our flesh and live our lives. And Lord, it would be perfectly fine if you just said, I'm going to let them live their lives the way that they choose, away from me, and live eternally without me, suffering. But you didn't. You loved a sinful humanity so much that you sent your son to live in the flesh, to suffer Not for anything that he did wrong, because we know that he had no sin. But he suffered for the sins that we commit. Suffered for the sins of man. And Lord, you saved us. It's hard for us to even believe that you cared so much about us. That you saved your enemies. So Lord, thank you so much for all that you've done for us, especially sending your son Jesus. Lord, I pray that our spirits will be enlivened this morning, understanding this again, knowing that we've had a pretty bleak year, many of us, a lot of sickness, a lot of political unrest and just general disagreement within the world within our nation, within our churches, within our families. This morning, Lord, let us unite as we talk about your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that hearts will be changed this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Uh, fifth graders, if you would like to make your way uh, downstairs, you can go to your classes with your teachers, and or you're welcome to stay in here as well. If you have your Bibles, just leave them open to Matthew chapter 1. And what a, a joyful week to, to think and celebrate, and I hope you'll take some time this week to, to really meditate and think on what God has done for us in sending His Son, and that's what we're going to spend our time thinking about today. 
Uh, in talking about the miracle of Jesus' birth, Charles Spurgeon, the, the well-known English pastor in the 1800s, uh, reflected with these words that I think capture uh, what we're going to be looking at. He, Spurgeon said this, thinking about Jesus. He said, infinite and an infant, eternal and yet born of a woman. Supporting a universe and yet needing to be carried in a mother's arms. King of angels and yet the son of Joseph. Heir of all things and yet the carpenter's despised son. What a paradox when we look at Jesus and his birth. And yet, this is exactly who he is, according to God's word. It seems impossible. How can a person be fully God and fully human? And yet, this is the beauty of what we celebrate at Christmas. This reality that allows us to know our creator, to see God in new and fresh ways, breathtaking ways. Seeing Jesus should take our breath away. And so this week and next week, we are taking two Christmas sermons to look at this uh, dichotomy, our parent dichotomy that is actually brought together in one person. These two great realities, Jesus, fully man and fully God. And what we see today is uh, looking at Jesus' humanity, right? Jesus' birth reveals God's desire for you to personally know and experience him. Who do we know? We know people, right? We relate to people in personal ways, people around us. And Jesus' birth means that God came so that you can know him. So why does it matter? Why does that matter that God would take on human form? Have you ever really stopped and thought about that? that Jesus would become a, a person. Yes, it, it's something we celebrate, something we sing about every Christmas. But have you ever really stopped and thought about, well, what does it mean? Why did Jesus have to become a person? What, what's so important about that? And I want us to stop and, and just realize today that God came in such a way that we can know him. God wants you to know him in a personal way. And there's a direct connection in how well we know God to how we live. The more we know God, the more we're going to live in a way that glorifies God, that reflects God in our life. The less we know God, the more we're going to look like whatever we want to do and without God. And so this week, we're going to take a look at what it means to know God in a personal way and what Jesus' birth reveals to us about how we can know God, what we should know about God. And so let's explore what Jesus, taking on flesh, coming as a baby, reveals uh, to you to bring you a greater knowledge of God in a way that changes your life. All right, the first thing we see is that Jesus took on flesh to reveal God's love for you. Maybe you come here today and you don't really feel that. Does God really love me? I've done some things this week or I've done some things in the past. I've talked to people a certain way and we have this hint of doubt. Yeah, we, we know it, we've heard it, God loves you. Do we believe it? Do you believe that God actually loves you? And that is exactly what we see in the birth of Jesus. Look at verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Stop here, and I just want us to think about this phrase, the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus was born. A human birth, the eternal son, the second person of the Trinity, 
putting on flesh and blood, becoming fully human in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Just stop a minute and be amazed at this. God born. John 1, 14, the word became flesh. And flesh here isn't just a, merely a reference to the human body. It is the, the, the fullness of what it means to be human. Jesus had a human body. Jesus had a human mind, human emotions, a human will. That's what it means when Jesus took on flesh. He became like us in every way. Hebrews 2 and 4, uh, Hebrews 4 teach us that to save human beings, Jesus had to be made like us in every respect. So the weaknesses you feel, Jesus felt weak. The times that make you sad, Jesus felt sadness. The temptation to sin, Jesus was tempted. Yet without sin. That is the only difference between Jesus and you. Everything you've lived or felt, he's felt except sin. And in the incarnation, the, everything human was united to the Son of God. And the Son of God did not only become like man, he actually became truly and fully man. In Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body, Colossians 2.9. And what we see in John, 1 John, we see another testimony of this. Listen to what he says, 1 John 1, 1 through 2. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that, that life was revealed, and we have seen it. And we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. Do you, do you hear those words? We touched it. We've seen it. We've touched the Son of God. And so we think of, of God doing this, but we don't stop there with just thinking about what he's done. We think about why. What does this tell me about how God sees me, that he would come to me, that he would come to you, that he would come to human people to, to show who he is. And the first thing we must think and realize is that the only reason God would do this is because he loves us. He loved us enough to leave eternal glory. God gave that up to come and feel what you feel, to hurt in the way you hurt. God loves you. And he loved you enough to humble himself and face all those difficulties. He loved you enough to reveal himself in a way that you can understand. You can look at him and see that he lived the perfect life. And he is what you need because you don't live the perfect life. He came to show you his great love. Our God is the eternal God who was born in a stable not a distant, withdrawn God. If you are tempted to feel distant from God, realize that he came so you don't have to feel distant from him. He wants you to draw close to him. Our God is a humble, giving God, not a selfish, grabbing God. Right? He came to give his life freely as a ransom for you. God's love in Colossians 3 is communicated to us like this. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved. As God's people, you are chosen and holy and dearly loved. And that is what we see in the birth of Jesus. You are dearly loved by God. God loves you enough to come to you, but also he wants to come to you not just so that you see him from a distance, that you know him. You know God. You have his presence in your life. Do you know him? If you don't know him, you're missing the gift of Christmas, the depths of 
the wonders of what God has done. He came so that you can know him. Don't push him away. Don't ignore him. To not want to know God, to not pursue knowing God, is rejecting God's gift of love for you in the birth of Jesus. But also it is knowing God's love for you that then enables you to love others. So look at the fruit to find the root, right? Do you have love for others? If you lack love for others, then you don't maybe know God's love for you. The root produces the fruit. So the question for you is how will you respond to the love that God has already made evident and revealed to you? Jesus coming as a human reveals he loves enough to come into your life. His birth was the first step toward the cross where he laid down his life for you, the ultimate act of love. And so we see Jesus' life from beginning to end is a demonstration of his love for you, birth coming to you, death dying for you, and the birth was the first step toward the cross. That is love. You can entrust your life to a God who loves you like that, who did not spare anything, did not spare his own life. And so you can come to him and he will welcome you wherever you are, whatever you've done. His affection, his care for you has no limits. So live in his love, submit your life to his love and his presence and his will. First, by becoming a Christian, but secondly, as a Christian, dying to yourself and pursuing him. So we see that his birth, Jesus' birth reveals God's love for us. And if there was ever a doubt in your mind that God loves for you, look and see what he's done and be reminded, no, God does love me. But then secondly, we see that Jesus took on flesh to reveal God's initiating power to save you. Look at verse 18 again. The birth of Jesus Christ came about in this way after his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. It was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. What we see here is that God entered the world on his own initiative, his own will. Nobody forced him to come. God is not a passive God who doesn't care but a God who is at work in a fallen world. The Holy Spirit, we see here in verse 18, is the one who put this baby in Mary's womb. God did it. Nobody else. And it was not a surprise. In fact, it was predicted by prophets hundreds of years before this. Perhaps the clearest passage that that reveals this is Isaiah 9, 6. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Child, son, human, right? The government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In this verse, Isaiah sees a son that will be born in the human flesh. God was not surprised. God planned this. God is an active, working God who does it on his own initiative. This Jesus, the the son who willingly chose to leave heaven and put on flesh by his own will. Our God is a purposeful, planning God, not a random, reactionary God. Nothing in this world is a surprise to him. Nothing. As surprising as this year has been to every one of us, none of it surprised God. And in fact, God is working whether we see it or not, which means that if God is sovereign, if God does things on his own initiative, according to his own will and purposes and plans, you can have hope in him. Outside of everything else, you can trust in the God who is at work to accomplish his good purposes. God is a God who begins his work in your life because he loves you and wants you to know him. He came to us as a baby because he knew, Romans 3, 11, that no one seeks God. So he came and sought us. That is what the birth 
of Jesus is God seeking us, coming to us, his work, his initiative. If you have believed in Jesus, it is because God sought you. He spoke to your heart. He opened your blind eyes to see. He opened your ears to hear, to desire him in the same way that God did with Israel. Look at Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8. The Lord had his heart set on you and chose you, not because you were more numerous than all peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you. Stop and worship God. If you know Jesus, that God has opened your eyes to see him and to love him. God has done that for you. That is worth worshiping him. Jesus coming in the flesh reminds us that God came to us when we walked away from him. We walked away from him in the Garden of Eden, every single one of us from that moment on. And God came to us when we had left him. And so we see God's initiating work in this world and in our lives. Also, we see that Jesus' birth reveals his power. The Holy Spirit is powerful to create human life, a virgin birth. And he is powerful to accomplish his plans perfectly. Look at verse 19. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. God did not leave this to chance. He powerfully intervened so that Jesus' birth would play out exactly how it needed to play out. He sent an angel in a dream. This doesn't happen every day. God is powerfully moving in this, this whole scenario to bring about God's good plan and purposes to save you. Power supernaturally displayed can only be credited to God. And this reminds us of, of Daniel 4, what Nebuchadnezzar came to realize about God's power. Listen to this, Daniel 4, verses 34 through 35. Then I praised the Most High, honored and glorified him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does what he wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can block his hand. Joseph tried to block his hand, and God overcame it through sending angels supernaturally. Jesus' birth as a human reveals that God is a God far above us and who is not like us in our ways, and yet he came to us to become like us. But he is not a God that we can put in a box and control. He rules the world. And God's power revealed in the birth of Jesus and later magnified in his rising from the dead after paying the penalty on the cross for our sins has great implications for your life. Have you ever thought about God's power and how it can affect your life? God has made it available to us so that we can know his power personally. So he has the power to free you from the grip of fear, the grip of regret, the grip of discouragement and bitterness and the need of control. Why? Because God has power over all these things. He demonstrates his power in every area of life. You don't need to fear when you know that God will provide and he gives life. You don't need to worry about regrets when you know his grace covers every sin and failure and guilt. You don't need to be discouraged when you realize that God is powerful and he is at work accomplishing all of his purposes 
And he works for your good if you know him. And he is trustworthy and faithful. You don't need to be bitter when you realize that God forgives and God redeems and God will judge righteously. You don't need to have a perfect control over your life when you realize that God is leading according to his good purposes and he has perfect control over this world. Nothing is to chance. God is in control. And God wants you to know that he is at work and he is powerful. Why? And that's what we see at the end of this passage. To save you. So you know his salvation. And you live in his salvation. Look at verse 21. She will give birth to a son. And you are to name him Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. If God loves you. If God is at work in this world and God is powerful, he can save you. And you can know it. You can live it and experience it in your life. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. The name Jesus literally means God saves. Because God's children are humans, made of flesh and blood, the son became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of sin and death. Hebrews 2.17 says that Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. Jesus had to become like his brothers to do that. And he has done it. He was born as a man because he had to be a man to be our true representative, to pay the price for our sins. He lived the life we were supposed to live. He faced everything we fa have faced and passed every test. We failed, and he died the death that we were condemned to die. We deserve to die. All of us. Jesus took our place by becoming a man. And he could only do it if he was fully man. Our God is a God who redeems us by his blood, saves us, not a God who leaves us in our sin. That's what Jesus' birth shows us. In thinking about Jesus coming to save you, putting on flesh for you, this should stop and make us realize there is no other way. Jesus wouldn't have done it. Jesus wouldn't have come to be born if there was another way. This is hard. It's not easy. It's not a light thing that Jesus would take on flesh and suffer as a human, the ultimate death. You may have thought you could earn your way to God. You may have thought you have lived a good enough life and God will honor that. You may have been thinking that simply believing in God, I believe there's a God, that's enough. However, all these ways of thinking leave room for doubt and fear and insecurity. And let me just say, if you feel fear and doubt and insecurity, you're living in that? Are you really trusting in God to save you or in yourself? Are you really putting your hope in him? You can't live in fear and doubt and insecurity if you know that God. You belong to him, and that is enough. Man-made religion is our attempt to make our way to God, to get up there somewhere through our own efforts somehow. But the gospel is that God came to, down to rescue us, and we've allowed him to rescue us. Jesus came and took on flesh so that you can have no doubt. You can be secure in him. And the security comes when you accept what he started in his birth. That salvation comes through, by grace through faith in Jesus alone and what he has done. What he has shown that he is faithful to do. What he's powerful to do. Jesus had to be born in order to purchase your forgiveness. Laying down his life in place of yours. So what should you do in response to the birth of Jesus 
as a human baby taking on flesh. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15 is what Paul did and what he calls us to do. For the love of Christ, we've seen the love of Christ displayed in the birth of the baby. For the love of Christ compels us, it moves us, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The birth of Jesus compels us to live for him. The birth of Jesus taking on flesh gives us a glimpse of his love for us. Why would we neglect so great a love? Consider his love personally offered to you, planned by God and mighty to save you and welcome this love into your life, but not at a distance, in a regular, personal, ongoing way. Regularly re reminding yourself of his love, knowing his love, hearing him speak to you, his grace and love for you. Live to know the, the love that Christ has for you. Make that your purpose. You wake up in the morning, I want to know God's love for me in new ways. Humbling yourself. You won't know God's love unless you humble yourself and come to him. Putting aside your sin, asking him to save and forgive you and living in his presence and dying to your sin and living for him each day. This is what the birth of Jesus compels us to do. Will you do it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love, your great power, your work to save us that is displayed in sending your son, eternal God, to take on flesh. This is a mystery. And yet it is true. And so we today are humbled by what you have done. And we are moved to worship. That you would do this for us. God, may we see this invitation of your love to know your power, to know your work, to know you in new and deeper ways. And may we pursue that with our lives. Lord, open our, our eyes, open our ears to hear, deepen our love for you today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna respond to God's word. Y'all can stand and, and we're gonna sing. And just, uh, we have much reason to sing, don't we? After hearing what God has done, amen. we have reason to, to sing and praise him for how he has shown himself to us. If you have any questions about what it means to know God, we would love to talk with you about that. So let's stand and sing together.
cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Praise God that he has come to us, our Emmanuel. I uh, want to wish each of you all a Merry Christmas if you're joining us online. hope you all have a Merry Christmas this week as well, thinking on God's great love uh, for us and what he has done in coming to us. Um, no youth ministry meeting tonight. We'll be resuming after the holidays on Sunday nights with the middle school and high school students. Also want to ask you to prayerfully consider, if you haven't given already, to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions um, we've set a goal of $7,500 for this church to support missionaries. Every dollar of that goes straight to uh, missionaries going out on the field. And uh, if you would like to give uh, to that offering or to the church, you can give online or you can give on your way out as an act of worship to God. So as we close out, let me read Luke 1, verses 46 through 48, Mary's reflection on the birth of Christ. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. And that is what God has done for us in our humble condition, our sinful condition. God has looked on us with favor. And so may we leave like Mary rejoicing in our Savior. Thank you all for worshiping with us. Good to see you all today. Hope you have a Merry Christmas. Thank you.